discussion of logistics management and how it plays a role in the entire process of supply chain and today our focus is on global logistics global logistics in this model we are going to have an introduction to global logistics in terms of what it does a definition and then we'll look at some global supply chains and appreciate some levels of complexity and then we we'll look at the forces toward globalization we are looking at, we also look at international market entry strategies. We will look at global transport options, some government influences, and then we we'll look at some advantages and obstacles to global logistics. Global logistics and distribution have played a key role in the growth and development of world trade and in integration of manufacturing on a worldwide scale. The use of appropriate distribution channels in the international markets increases the channels, the chances of success dramatically. In the United States, for example, the total logistics cost has amounted to 9 to 11% of the country's GDP every year in the latest, in the last decade, showing that indeed logistics contributes significantly to GDP, especially on the global front. Now, foreign trade has grown in tonnage and in value for the United States and other nations as well. As firms start operating on a global basis, logistics managers need to manage shipping of raw materials, components, and supplies among various manufacturing sites at the most economical and reliable rates. The development of intermodal transportation and electronic tracking technology has resulted in a quantum jump in the efficiency of the logistics methods employed by firms worldwide. Now you realize that when we talk about global logistics, we are actually looking at the design and management of a logistics system that directs and controls the, the flows of materials into, through and out of the firm across national boundaries to achieve its corporate objectives at a minimum total cost when we look at the definition of logistics management we look at it in a generic sense to mean all the flows within the supply chain how we manage it to achieve both efficiency and effectiveness in these flows but when we talk about global logistics the key emphasis is on a global network the network is not just a supply chain network which may be domestic, but now we are focusing on a global network. And therefore, when we are managing the flows, what we mean is that the flows are not restricted to just the local market or the domestic market, but when we cross national boundaries to even include the world at large. So you realize that when firms operating, usually they have the, the, the source of supply, and once the plants have engaged in assembly of products or have engaged in transformation of input into output, then the finished goods are dispatched to the customers. This time, what we're saying is that once the production has been engaged, this you know, distribution that is done usually in the local market, this time the customers are around the world. So therefore, the firm engages in a lot of you know, flows across the globe. But of course, Sometimes manufacturing is also done in different areas in the globe, as well as raw materials and components and supplies are also sourced from the global market. To effectively serve global markets, firms must therefore consider adopting integrated worldwide strategies. We have already established that the supply chain thrives on an integrated system where we see a total synchronization of the entire you know, players within the entire supply chain. Therefore, once we are managing logistics, we are dealing with the flows across the entire supply chain. Now that we are considering a supply chain that is global, then there must be an integration of all the worldwide strategies 
that are involved in the flow of goods and services within the network. So these firms are more likely to search for global sourcing for materials and components, depots, assembly, distribution centers, and logistics. Global firms typically design synchronous strategies around technology, marketing, manufacturing, and logistics. Synchronization here implies a strong integration. When we have fused them together, the strategies must be well aligned. When there are conflicting strategies, it makes it very difficult for the, the firm to compete very well in the global market. We already know that as you move into the international or global market, competition gets even more difficult, stronger or more fierce than the local market. Therefore, seeing an integration is required to compete in the local market, we need to even achieve a, a stronger level of integration or synchronization among the various strategies that we are using to compete in the market. Global supply chains, therefore, are worldwide networks of suppliers, manufacturers, warehouses, distribution centers, and retailers through which raw materials are acquired, transformed, and delivered to customers. So now, we are not just looking at a network of partners within a domestic market or within the local market, not even within the national borders, but we are looking beyond the national borders. It's a worldwide so it is possible that suppliers are located in different countries. Manufacturers are also in different countries. We may have distribution centers in different countries and even customers across, you know, the, the global environment. So global supply chains are really, you know, a, a very extended form of the, the local supply chains that constitute partners usually restricted in the local or domestic market. Therefore, such complexity has implication for logistics managers and, of course, organizations in general. For example, international distribution systems will get more widened. Manufacturing still occurs domestically, but distribution and, uh, and typically some marketing take place overseas. Now, that would mean that you would need to deal with a wide range of customers in different geographical areas. Distribution then must be managed such that it can overcome the, the barriers that we see beyond our, our borders, our national borders. Also, international suppliers would mean that raw materials and components are furnished by foreign suppliers. While there's an opportunity to tell from, you know, very, you know, cheap materials and high quality materials, the difficulty also lies in, in how to just gather all the different kinds of suppliers across the globe. Final assembly is performed domestically. In some cases, the final product is then shipped to foreign markets. Offshore manufacturing, too, is another implication of a global supply chain. Product is typically sourced and manufactured in a single foreign location, shipped back to domestic warehouse, warehouses for sale and world distribution. Now, we know that sometimes People go into different countries like, let's say, China to produce their goods and then they are still brought back into their countries and other countries for shipment to, uh, into, uh, to their clients. There is also the need to achieve a fully integrated global supply chain. Products are supplied, manufactured and distributed from various facilities located throughout the world. And you will need to ensure that all the different plants and supplies and distribution centers are well integrated to ensure a seamless flow in the entire logistics process. You know that traditionally we used to have a very simple, you know, network of supply chain partners that we we're dealing with. So it was relatively easier managing the integration necessary for the entire supply chain. For example, when you look at the suppliers from within the local or domestic supply chain, you realize that it had a, a more static supplier base. A static in the sense that we didn't see too much fluctuations and increase in decrement and all kinds of dynamism that we would usually see in a global supply chain, making it relatively easier to source items from these suppliers. And the fact that they are usually concentrated 
in, in the same area or a few different areas made it fairly easier to manage. So there were usually established logistics network to manage. And then once we are crossing the borders, we have limited border crossing. Sometimes you don't even go through national borders. Just within the same country, you move from one city to another and it is fairly easier to manage. There is also a coordinated custom procedure we go through even when we have to move beyond some, some borders. But, and then when you look at the tracking system or the careers, there were established, you know, career base. And that most of these careers are known because they have been used over time and some level of rapport has already been established. There is an existing infrastructure that is built and there's effective regulatory agencies concerning that. Now, when you come to the plants or let's say the factories or manufacturing, you know, plants, we see regional plant locations just within the same country. We may have different regions or we may have a centralized unit engaged in the entire production and assembly of raw materials. There's integrated logistics centers and cross docks. It is very easy to have them integrated because of the, you know, the smaller geographical coverage and then the distances, you know, between the various locations. And now when we come to the distribution of the items, after they have been manufactured in the plants, you realize that we usually engage in national distribution. And so the capacity we build usually is for the nation and it is fairly, you know, easier to manage and build. And then there's also specialized equipment because it is concentrating on more of a domestic market with very common needs. Therefore, the distances are also stable over time and then there isn't much fluctuation. Even though when you look at the domestic supply chain, it's not too easy to manage because there are some levels of complexities. There are some levels of, you know, differences in terms of the different players within the supply chain. As compared to the global supply chain, it is relatively easier to manage because the, com the complexity is not as as huge as that of the global supply chain. For example, when we take an extended global supply chain, this is what we face at the supplier side. The upstream of most organizations will begin to experience lots of dynamic supplier base. A supplier base that keeps on, you know, changing because of the social issues, the cultural issues, the economic issues influencing different kinds of suppliers. So when you look at even political environments in different, you know, environments, the political issues, you realize that it differs. All these add to the complexities we experience. The technological changes in different environments would also add to the dynamism that we experience in terms of our supplier base or the pool of suppliers that we are tapping, you know, our resources from. There's increased number of supplier options. That presents an opportunity to also get high quality products and cheaper prices. But also the increased number of supply options can also make it extremely difficult for management to take decisions, especially knowing that other competitors are also exploring the opportunity of tapping from the supply base, the very quality and cheaper materials. And then there's multiple source countries. One geographical area has its own complexities and difficulties, plus its own regulatory environment, legal issues coming, economic issues, even fluctuations in currencies, you know, is also another issue you have to look at. And so the multiple sources can also be difficult, especially when you are, you are just trying to buy different kinds of raw materials and the suppliers are differently, you know, located. That would mean that you have to find a way to design your logistics such that you can, you, you can find a way of consolidating at a certain point closer to all suppliers in order to ship back to the local you know, market where the plant is possibly you know, located. Sometimes it can be very difficult dealing with different kinds of you know, suppliers in different, different countries. But there also, there's also an opportunity to tap from high expertise in these areas. Now, when we look at border considerations, over here to the complexity lies in the multiple international border crossings. Imagine you are purchasing goods from about seven different countries. Then, of course, 
you are going to face multiple international border crossing challenges. Each one has its own peculiar needs. And you may have to build the competence to overcome the challenges. There are also complicated customs regulations. Complication lies in the fact that you are looking at multiple sources and so you must cross different borders. So the complications will also keep on increasing because you are moving from one you know, area to another. And so there are various data requirements that you have to. And this is why you need to build a strong logistics information system in order to be able to collect the right data and analyze to feed logistics managers on how to deal with these suppliers and tap from the right sources. Now, when we go to the plants, uh, or let's say the trucks, for example, in extended global supply chain, we see the use usually of almost all the modes. That is where we see the multiple mode requirements. The multiple mode, there are different kinds of modes, include the air, the sea, the water, the pipeline, and of course, the road is still another mode of consideration. And over here, what happens is that sometimes you will need to engage in intermodal services because one mode may not have the ability to deliver goods at the doorstep. So you may have to engage in multiple modes. And that is where the complexity also may arise and serve as a challenge. But of course, the various modes also present different kinds of opportunities for our logistics managers to tap on. There's a broad and diverse career base to choose from. Broad and diverse career base. And each one would have its own superior service that it provides. It's also an opportunity. By having diverse and many would also mean that you will need very quality information to analyze to choose the best careers. There's multiple language requirements when it comes to the tracking issues. There's multiple language requirements. You have to deal with regional customs, high level of coordination. And how to even, you know, align yourself to these restrictions can be a difficult. But of course, the opportunity lies in the different careers that you have available to ship your items from. Now, when we go to the plant, you realize that the plant too may have multiple locations. One location may not be endowed with the right resources. And so in order to be able to reduce the cost of operation, some organizations usually will locate different plants in different areas, sometimes because they are closer to the source of you know, materials to make it very easy to produce. So sometimes the that there's what we call the past commonization to make it easier. There's also flexible manufacturing. And flexible manufacturing makes it easier to adapt to opportunities in the market. But building a flexible manufacturing system, of course, is also very expensive. But if you want to be able to adapt to the dynamism in the global marketplace, building flexible manufacturing system will provide the key source to organizations to be competitive in the marketplace and then when we look at the distribution there's more increased mileage from one geographical area to another and that is why sometimes having multiple plant sources can help to reduce the distance because when you have a centralized system you will need to engage in longer distances for both inbound and outbound you know transportation and so sometimes there could be decentralized you know plants closer to some markets to reduce their outbound transportation operations while still maintaining some level of economies in the inbound transportation. And then there's international dealership network where we look at different parties, you know, involved in the entire channel of distribution. The opportunity is there to tap from high expertise level, but the difficulty also exists in managing a complex system involving different partners within the supply chain. Seeing this complexity means that an integrated logistics system is a sure way to really overcome the many difficulties and also to build a strong capability to take advantage of the numerous opportunities in the global marketplace. Now, if you look at this supply chain, the aerospace supply chain, you realize that there are more parties involved beyond just the local players. For example, when you look at the upstream, you see a lot of parties located in different parts of the world, likewise the downstream supply chain. And this necessitates that we build an integrated 
logistics network in order to achieve a seamless flow in the entire supply chain. This is also another one for the oil and gas supply chain on a global level. And this one even makes us appreciate even the more complexities in the system. And the, and the higher the complexity, the need to build in an integrated system to make the system very smooth. Now, let's look at the reasons why organizations go global. Why are organizations building different plants in different you know, locations in the globe? Why are organizations also locating different markets to sell their produce? Why are organizations you know, now having you know, very complex distribution systems across the globe? Why are organizations now sourcing you know, for materials from the global market? Why are organizations going global? Because in a previous slide, we have well established that as the supply chain gets global, there are complexities by in the fact that the network gets more complex with so many players coming in with different you know, backgrounds. And having different backgrounds further add to the complexity. Yet, organizations keep on going global. Why are organizations extending their businesses to the global market. We are going to look at four major forces to this issue. We're looking at the global market forces, the technological forces, global cost forces, and political and economic forces. For example, when it comes to the global market forces, we have well established that now organizations face a global you know, competition. Now the competition is not just restricted to the domestic market. Whether you are moving your plants or your resources or your skills to the wider environment or not, others are coming even to your domestic market. So those who move, whether you buy from different countries or sell in different countries, others are joining you in your domestic market. Now it means that we are facing, you know, a, a, a competition that is more fierce. So there's pressure created by foreign comp competitors in the domestic market. Now we see a lot of goods and services coming from other countries into the domestic market. That presupposes that once you are there, you are facing a global competition. So you have no choice than also to explore the opportunities in the global market in order to compete. Otherwise, these foreigners will push you away from your domestic market. And because they are extending their businesses to other countries, they are able to exploit economies in production. So they produce in high quantities to sell in other countries, even though they have additional distribution costs. Usually the economy they achieve in production is able to offset or derail much of the costs associated with distribution. And so they are still able to compete with a lot of the domestic you know, producers, even within the domestic market. In order to stay in the market, you may have to explore opportunities in the global market in order to also stay competitive. There are also opportunities created by foreign customers. Now, when you are producing in the local market, sometimes you are restricted to in terms of the quantity you are producing because your market may not be that very large. But there could be other opportunities in other countries where you can just get your product to these countries and still sell. So the opportunities to just get your product or services in different parts of the world in order to increase your market share. So the global environment, the global market is so huge and big that if you want to increase your market share, is an op uh, one of the opportunities that present to you. And much of the demand growth available to companies is in foreign and emerging markets, certainly. So sometimes you can easily go to emerging markets and realize that there's high demand for your product. So much of the demand growth available to companies is in foreign and emerging markets. And so it can be an opportunity for you. Increasing demand for products throughout the world through the global proliferation of what information. And then geographic diversification. Now, having a geographic diversification means the ability to just add on your, 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 your production. But sometimes adding on your domestic market does not provide you the opportunity to sell those products and services. So sometimes to diversify will require you to move to different areas of the globe in order to sell the new products. Yes. And so 
firms wishing to grow their business but not finding you know buyers in the local market may want to look at other areas in other parts of the world in order to find you know buyers for their products and that is what we refer to as geographic diversification diversification extended to other geographical areas and then it's an also an opportunity to just you know exploit your excess production capacity sometimes you may have the capacity to produce even way beyond your local markets but you wouldn't find all the buyers in the local market and that would have implication on the amount of goods held in inventory but because you don't want to experience too much cost and the opportunity that lies in producing more you would want to look at the possibility of looking at other markets in other areas so that you can engage in more production when you have higher capacity beyond your local market the only way to exploit your capacity is to find you uh, you know buyers from other parts of the world products near the end of their life cycle in the domestic market could generate growth in the international market yes sometimes we see a whole decline of product in domestic market but in some parts of the world you realize that that product that is almost dying or that is dead is even a new product in another country altogether so sometimes organizations may have to explore in other areas the possibility of selling their products that seem to be declining in their domestic market it can even be at the introduction stage in different markets altogether all right and then foreign markets can be a source of new products and ideas certainly particular markets often serve to drive technological advances in some areas so sometimes people are rushing to places like china and go because of the opportunity of tapping into their technological issues all right companies forced to develop and enhance leading edge technologies and products so sometimes you need to go and tap into the expertise of some countries because of the ability to provide advanced levels of technology so that you'll be able to compete very well in your domestic market such products can be used to increase or maintain market position in other areas or regions where the markets are not as competitive now let's look at the technological forces the technological advances particularly in icts have enabled a better coordination of activities between different links in the chain through logistics so sometimes because we see the advances in ict it provides an opportunity to link up with other you know partners in other parts of the globe you know traditionally most people would not just be moved beyond their national borders because of the difficulty in achieving integration without an IT system. But now we know that there's improved visibility among supply chain partners with the use of ICT. Therefore, it drives organizations to just, you know, have a network, you know, with other people. So integration is easier achieved with ICT in place, irrespective of the geographical distance. All right, so technologies are used to undertake joint decision to coordinate shipping in just in time systems and to manage inventories in real time low and falling telecommunication cost specific technical expertise and technology may be available in certain areas or regions and all these present opportunities for firms to tap into these you know you know technological advances now let's begin to look at global cost factors or forces Global cost factors often dictate global location decisions. Sometimes you are forced to change loca location because of some, you know, forces that are coming from the global cost issues. For example, there may be cheaper taxes and import duties in other areas that may drive other people to go into, you know, such areas. Maybe the, the taxes and the duties in a particular environment you are operating may be relatively higher. And so as you explore the global marketplace, you may, have to, you may want to relocate your facilities or your business in order to take, you know, advantage of such opportunities. There may be availability of cheap raw materials in some places. So it's a cost issue. Maybe in your local market, perhaps the competition is highly influenced by your ability to become so efficient. When the competition is driven by cost, you have no choice than to find opportunities to reduce your cost. 
And so sometimes to reduce your cost of operations, one of the ways is to tap from sources where the raw materials are relatively cheaper in order to compete. In some cases, cheaper labor is sufficient justification for overseas manufacturing. And we have seen a lot of organizations move to China mainly because of, you know, cheaper source of labor. So they go there in order to reduce their cost of operations. And then once the production is completed, they are shipped back into their local market for distribution, of course, other markets in which they operate. And there may also be av availability of efficient and cheap technology in some areas. And so some may want to relocate their own facilities to tap from these you know, opportunities in technology in order to reduce the cost of operations. Then let's look at political and economic forces. Exchange rate fluctuations can also cause organizations to move global. Some areas may have, you know, very good currency levels. Others may be so fluctuating that it may not favor the business. So some people will look at the business environment, even based on these exchange rates and all that. There may be regional trade agreements between organizations or let's say countries that may cause you know, organizations to move to other countries to operate or sell their produces in the countries who have agreement with them. All right, then the tariff systems. When the tariff systems may also favor organizations, it, may, it can also encourage them to move to some areas. Trade protection mechanisms as well, when it favors them, they may want to move to areas where the protection favors them. Government procurement policies can also influence some organizations to go global, especially, for example, if the government policy requires that you tap from cheaper sources or apply e-procurement systems. Tax exemptions in some areas, especially in free zone areas, can also influence some organizations to go global. For example, some go to free zone areas to buy their raw materials for operations in order to reduce their cost of production. Now, let's take a look at international market entry strategies. Those who are moving into the global environment or who are moving into the global marketplace, what strategies exist for them to choose? There are a lot of strategies that exist, each one having its own merit and demerit. And depending on your operations, you may have to examine each one into detail and then choose which one will suit you. We have what we call the exporting as a strategy. Some may also want to use licensing. Others may want to use joint ventures. Others ownership, importing, and counter trade. When we say exporting, this is the strategy where organizations produce in their own local countries and then ship and sell in other countries. That is exporting. So they produce in their own countries and you know sell in other countries. Usually, this is relatively easier for organizations who have established a strong presence for producing in their local market. And because exporting would usually not require you to build plants in, you know, in the country you are selling, should there be any changes in the market requiring a change in terms of your distribution network or where you must sell your product, it is very easier for firms to you know, make such a decision. Therefore, there's flexibility here in terms of making changes in the market, market locations, and even your distribution system. So that is the opportunity in exporting. And so those who have established a strong presence can produce beyond their current, you know, demand, especially when they have their excess capacity and sell in other locations. Those who want to, you know, you know, exploit their excess capacity Exporting can also be an opportunity to just produce beyond what they are producing to sell in other places. One disadvantage is that sometimes it is very, very difficult to compete with indigenous firms who have established a strong distribution network in their own countries. And so those who want to engage in exporting may have to find, you know, buyers and establish a very strong relationship with them. Sometimes because of the language barrier and all that, going through agents and those who must interpret can also be a strong challenge. But if you also find the right agents, they can be of great assistance to you.
And then we look at the licensing. Sometimes some organizations are already operating with their own brand products. They have had a good name for their product and these brands may have power, communicating some sense of power in the market. And so some organizations, instead of producing entirely a different product, which is not known, they find a way to penetrate the market with ease using an existing product or service, but with a brand name. And so once you want to use a brand which has a, a, a name and a strong competitive, you know, you know, a competitive edge in the market, some organizations go into agreement with these standard organizations. And what they give them is the license to operate using their product brand. And there are variety. Some of them will make you follow their processes and supervise and all that. And so licensing is a right to use a name of the organization to produce. So if any organization has established a strong you know, brand name, they can give you the license to operate. And then they charge you what they call you know, the, 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 the commission or the rate. You have to pay them you know, a percentage of the profit that you generate. So it's a whole agreement you enter into. This one also provides an opportunity to pen penetrate an international market with ease because the brand name is already established and known. And sometimes the, 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 the market does not even have a knowledge that an organization is operating under a license. What they know is that the product is that has already existed. And so it provides an opportunity for you to penetrate the international market with ease without necessarily having to engage in strong publicity to just try and encourage you know consumers to accept your new product and especially when organizations are moving into different parts of the globe where they did not exist the licensing provides an opportunity to penetrate there with ease without having to go through so many challenges one major disadvantage is that you continue to you know pay royalties to these organizations who have given you the right and it means that once your business is moving on they will still continue to enjoy and enjoy and enjoy so there's inflexibility in terms of control and what you want to do sometimes it, it, even if you want to be very innovative by creating something so substantially different from what is existing you are restricted because that is not what the right covers However, it's also an opportunity to overcome a lot of, you know, restrictions or difficulties in the market. And now, when it comes to joint ventures, this is where organizations join forces. So they join forces and it becomes, you know, part owners. And that can be based on the, contrib um, the percentage of contribution. So the profits can be based on the, the percentage of, you know, contribution. All right. And this one also pre presents an opportunity for firms who are moving into different parts of the world. And so once you are moved into a different part, you may want to join forces with an established organization and then the profits are shared. This one reduces the risk of just having to bear the whole burden and in case of any failure, having to bear the entire burden alone. So the risk just as the profits are shared, the risks are also shared. The difficulty is that when a foreigner moves into a foreign country, the local, you know, the local person may usually use the, the, his right to sometimes just try and abuse the right of the foreigner. Therefore, the foreigners who are coming into joint venture agreements may need to study the systems and the legal issues in order to know and protect their rights as well. All right, and then we have the direct ownership. The direct ownership is when organizations move into, you know, the global marketplace, maybe different environments, and establish a whole new organization. So this one is a whole set of plans. You know, you build your own plant or facility or your whole business from the beginning to an end. The opportunity here is that once the business does well, you enjoy the profit alone. But the difficulty is that one, you must find a way to compete with the locals, those who are ready in the domestic market. 
And because they might have established a strong network and distribution system, sometimes it becomes difficult. And because sometimes social cultural issues like acceptance by their people it can be also very difficult. However, for new products and nuclear products, it's also an opportunity to compete, all right, in such markets. And then when there's also a failure, the cost burden may be huge, especially when there has been huge investment in building facilities and also other forms of capacities in the system. And that is why those who want to choose ownership may have to engage in thorough research about the market before entering to know the degree of risk level. If the market is, is highly fluctuating, it might not be the best option to go. Because when there's any failure, it is difficult. And then when there needs to be a change, it provides an inflexible approach to make those kind of changes. All right. And then important, the, the important is just the opposite of exporting. Important means that moving into a foreign country to just buy goods into your domestic, you know, market. So important means that buying the goods that have already been produced and just resell it. This one too becomes easier when the organization does not have as much, you know, capacity to build its own, you know, facilities and starting a whole new product. And sometimes too, it's an opportunity to use unique products in foreign countries to compete in the domestic market. The disadvantage is that you have to also go through some border restrictions, the payment of, you know, duties and what have you can also be difficult. Sometimes too, Managing, you know, your, your, your suppliers who are beyond your geographical borders may provide a little inflexibility. But now, because there's ICT, it has also improved the integration and visibility that is required to manage in that. And it also provides a very good opportunity. The currency fluctuating also can be an issue to really deal with during importation. When currencies are fluctuating, it can also you know present some complexity for buyers and so buyers would need to you know constantly study the the the, the issues of currency fluctuation and manage to really improve their businesses in a counter trade agreement different countries may go into an agreement or different organizations they may go into an agreement to exchange goods but this time it is exchange not with mana money but other goods all right but the valuation it's just done in real currency terms. So counter trade, a typical example is the butter system. So there is also another way. It's usually done based on the government level than just individual organization. But it's also possible for organizations to exchange goods of the same value or relative value. Let's look at some global transportation options. More complex than domestic due to distance a number of parties involved. Major international transportation modes are the ocean, the air, motor rail, and that of the pipeline. Of course, the pipeline has a limitation in terms of just supplying the liquids, the gases, and the slurry products, but all five can be used. But when it comes to among these five, the most, you know, the predominantly used ones are the ocean, air, motor, and that of rail for most of the physical distribution the complexity lies in the fact that longer geographical distances are being covered and also there are border issues you have to deal with as you move from one place to another now let's look at the ocean the ocean there are three major structures the linear the charter and that of the private the linear is scheduled service or the regular route and then the charter is a contract service that is where no set routes are set so it is based on what? A contract or a charter. And then we have the private where the service firm's own logistics needs will just deal with that. So based on this, any of them can be an option. It includes bulk or container, you know, you know, transportation, where we just transport so huge goods in containers, what we commonly call the cargo. Most pervasive and important global mode now because of the ability to ship high quantities from one country to another. And so when we are looking at importing or exporting, we see that the ocean is playing a major role, especially when they are in bulk. Revenues are very substantial, 
and the deregulation of international maritime and ocean linear industries has provided freedom to separate established service and capacity on shaping lanes. Now, when we take the air, the speed allows large compression of transit times. Leakages with package delivery and courier services provide true point-to-point -point service. Rates have traditionally restricted cargo to low density by high value goods. The volume is approximately 1% of movement by nearly 20% of the value. So one major advantage of the air is that the speed is the highest. In fact, it is very fast. But the disadvantage is that it is only the transit time within the transit, the main transit time. But beyond the terminal points, you may have to still fall on other modes of transport to continue. But the advantage is that the speed level is high. One disadvantage is that it is unable to ship high quantities and it is limited to some kind of goods. You cannot just use the air to transport any kind of goods. And when we are looking at bulk, the air is not a way to go. But in terms of expediting some specialized shipment on smaller quantities, it provides an opportunity to meet the delivery times, thereby providing a great opportunity to meet the service level. When a supply chain, you know, strategy emphasizes responsiveness, air is a major mode that easily, you know, allows you to achieve high responsiveness. However, when your, your, your clients are not ready to pay for high charges in transportation, it becomes a difficult approach to choose because of its high cost in operation. All right, now the motto, the global motto characteristics of speed, safety, reliability, and accessibility are basically the same as for the domestic transportation. And we also say that it is highly accessible once you go into the particular city requiring of transportation within the city, the most predominantly used is the motor because of its high accessibility and the fact that it's so flexible and versatile and it can ship almost every kind of item and can go through all kinds of, you know, routes, different kinds of routes. And it is the one that is flexible to provide door-to-door -door services. And so when you are looking at sending door-to-door you know, deliveries, the mode that is, you know, usually chosen for most products is the motto. And it is very, very important to you. Only that usually the motto is restricted to national borders and a few international, you know, borders. It doesn't, it doesn't offer the opportunity to move across, you know, the global environment. That is the major disadvantage of the of the track but it helps especially for intermodal services the track or the road or the moto is one sure way to just enable the transportation of you know goods all right and the rail the international rail movements are problematic rail gauges often you know vary containers may be transloaded from rail to ocean to rail and or moto if standard international sizes are used Maritime bridge movement gains speed by using an intermodal strategy to help the situation. But of course, the rail also provides an opportunity to shape relatively higher bulks within the global environment. But when we are moving from um, country to country, mostly the ocean is the one that is predominantly used. But the rail also assists to just, you know, shape a lot of the products that have been sent. All right. Let's now look at the governmental influences. How government influences, you know, you know, global logistics activities and the need to understand some of these influences and just prepare yourself to just meet these regulations. There are customs regulations that firms will need to just abide by them. There are other customs functions and then we have the foreign trade zones. All these are government influences that organizations must recognize and actually obey in order to smoothen the entire process of ensuring the goods move from one place to another. For example, the customs regulations of the important country have the greatest effect on the international movement of goods. It aims to protect domestic industries from unfair or predatory competition. And these barriers to trade are handled differently in various countries. They are not to discourage trade, but the essence is to, pro, pro, you know, protect 
the local producers or the local industry from other countries who may want to abuse their, their, their rights in the market. And so once governments put in customs regulation, they regulate to ensure that their domestic markets are still protected from you know, predatory competition in the, in the country. So duties are expressed either as a percentage of value, a fixed amount, or in combination of that. So these customs regulations are there, and there are different kinds of regulations that are put there. And the primary essence is to also protect the domestic industry sometimes people dump all kinds of materials into the domestic market to just abuse you know the market but once these custom regulations are there it protects the populace of a particular country for such you know dumped items so the other custom functions which include the fact that it determines that the goods value is as stated as it is so that people will not just abuse people with wrong values stated. They also ensure that the goods are properly labeled. So that if they are, they are trying to dump goods in the market, they will just easily be able to identify them. They also ensure that the items are permitted for entry. They ensure correct price and quantity. And they also ensure payment of customs duties as well. And all these influences are there. Sometimes... It can appear as challenging for organizations because these, you know, influences or customs regulations differ from country to country. But generally, they don't exist to discourage trade, but rather to encourage, you know, the right and standard practices in different markets across the globe. And then we have what we call the foreign trade zones. So this one is a special arrangement made by government. And this one also to encourage usually local producers for, you know, producing. So a free trade zone is an area that is located within a nation such as Ghana, but is considered to be outside the customs territory. So once it's outside the customs territory, the regulation by the customs will not be the same for the free zone area. Hence, goods introduced into a free trade zone are generally not subject to the usual customs controls. So such zones are administered by customs authorities and provide relief from import duties and taxes for goods that are held within their borders. So free trade zones have been introduced in many countries in an effort to encourage the development of external trade. This one is not to cause problem or when we say that they have been relieved, it doesn't mean that they've been relieved from regulations um, or, or let's say the laws that regulate abuse. It doesn't mean people can just abuse it. No, it is there to just relieve them of some burdens, such as the import duties and taxes, in order to encourage production. So it's a special arrangement that is given. All right. So free um, trade zones provide cash flow and operating benefit to zone users, including the fact that goods enter without customs formalities, duty or bond. There may be also lower tariff rates. There can be also exchange rate agent for them. Import quota not applicable so that you can buy very huge quantities. Buyer can test or sample before entry. Shapers can break bulk before entry. Goods can be processed, repacked, or remarked to avoid fines before entry. And the fact that goods can be stored indefinitely and or re-exported without paying duties. All right, let's begin to examine some few advantages of global supply chains. Global supply chains. It can reduce total cost of operations, especially for firms who engage in huge or, you know, mass production. They're able to achieve a lot of economies in production. And once you have an opportunity to sell most of these goods in different parts of the world, the economies that you achieve is able to reduce the entire cost of operation. Usually when you produce limited quantities, it reduces machine utilization, therefore making cost of operation more and more expensive. So by having, you know, different markets in different parts of the globe, you are able to exploit your excess capacity by also reducing your cost of production in order to just, you know, help tap you know, the opportunity in 
in the global marketplace. There can also be inventory reduction as you go to global market because once you have so many markets for your produce, you do not need to keep so many inventory for a longer period of time. Sometimes some organizations, you know, hold inventory in their systems for a very long time, appreciable time, because they are restricting their sales to the domestic market. But when you have, you know, a demand that is higher, so huge, then it will deplete your inventory very faster than when you limit yourself to the domestic market. It also has an opportunity to improve the fulfillment cycle time, especially when you are tapping from the high, you know, or advanced technological expertise in other areas of the world. Then you can also, it can also help to reduce your forecast, you know, to increase your forecast accuracy. It can also help to increase your productivity level, improve your capacity, expansion of international presence, especially for geographical uh, specialization. It also helps to increase intellectual assets, delivery improvement, diversify business and trading, and then competitive advantage in general. Then on top markets, that is where you sell your products that are declining in your domestic market in different markets, which can also be a new product altogether. And also the enhanced speed and efficiency that you can even tap from, you know, high expert, you know, 3PLs, arrangements, and what have you. They are all opportunity for you to. And then let's examine some potential obstacles. For every good thing comes, but not without its own, you know, issues you have to look at and overcome. Sometimes member nations versus non-member nations, especially when it comes to trade agreements, you know, it can be very discouraging to enter into some areas. Inefficient transportation and distribution systems in some areas can also discourage you from moving. Sometimes the market may be huge, but they may have very poor, you know, road infrastructure. And then market instability. When the market keeps on fluctuating in some areas, it can also discourage you from moving into areas. Different languages, of course, differences in currencies. Differences in measurement system, especially when it comes to customs regulations. As you move from one area to another, measurement system may differ. And sometimes so even, you know, negotiating when measurement systems differ, it also adds further to their complexity. Then there come different customs, beliefs, and culture. And of course, culture can even influence the type of product to make and even the way it is packaged. And it means that when there are cultural there's what we call cultural diversity. You may have to also build a portfolio of products to deal with the different cultures. And that one can also add up to cost. Then the political turmoil in different areas can also sometimes, when the, there's high, huge political you know, instability, it can also be very, discour very discouraging. Sorry. Then trade imbalances, export surges and recession, that is, huge ones and then the ones that are coming down can also create imbalances especially sometimes you are unable to meet your demand because of some reductions here and there greater distance is also another thing there's one thing distributing a local you know a domestic market with sh relatively shorter distances than when you are distributing goods across larger distances you need to look in Find a way to deal with the complexities that you experience by crossing from different borders and the different restrictions that you would have to experience. Operational threats can also come up. Strategic challenge generally, you need to build more your strategic capability as you know you face more complexity. And sometimes the huge complexity, if it is not well managed or controlled, can rather you know destroy a lot of strategic you know designs that you have put up and then technological capabilities you need to build a strong technological capability to deal with the complexity and sometimes just because we're extending your your market area would mean that you need to make high investment in it and all these things will attract cost this brings us to the end of this model in this model we had to look at global logistics we saw the definition we appreciated the complexity of the global supply chain. 
We also looked at some forces towards globalization. We have looked at some strategies that exist for organizations to go into the global marketplace. We have also looked at government influences. And then we have examined the advantages and obstacles of going global. This brings us to the end of Model 5 on global logistics. Now, our last model is Model 6. And in Model 6, we are going to examine reverse logistics, how it is managed, the opportunities and the challenges involved in the entire process. Thank you for having me. Thank you.